Hi everyone, hello and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual event with Lena Meduana and Megan McDell to discuss Nervous System. Lena Meduana is the award-winning Chilean author of Nervous System and Seeing Red. She has received grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment for the Arts, and, the, and was a DAAD writer in residence in Berlin. She currently teaches at New York University. She's also joining us from Madrid tonight. Um, and our moderator tonight is Megan McDowell. Uh, Megan has translated many of the most important Latin American writers working today, including Samantha Schweblin and Alejandro Zambra. Her translations have won the English Pen Award and the Premio Valle Inclán and have been nominated three times for the International Booker Prize. Her short story translations have been featured in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Tin House, McSweeney's, and Gotham, among others. She's the recipient of a literature award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and she lives in Santiago, Chile. So a little bit about your screens tonight. Throughout the broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. And of course, you can order copies of Nervous System by pressing the green button right below. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. So now, let me bring Lena onto the screen. There's Megan. So Hi. Megan can join us. <laughs> hmm. Lena, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Would you click the camera button right over your icon? My camera button. I'm so sorry this is happening. We were just talking. Where yeah. would my camera I can be? If you head to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, there should be a little icon. Uh, bottom right corner? Left. I am not seeing that. You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to try to come back again. Oh, there oh. you go. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here I am. I don't know what happened. Okay. okay Great. I, I didn't do. Right. I didn't do actually anything. Hello. <laughs> Go for it, guys. All right. So, hi, Nina. Here we are. Um, How are you, Megan? How are you doing? Yes. I'm doing okay. Are you Are you awake enough for this? So, everyone, Lena is in is is in Madrid, where it is one in the morning. So. Yes. Yes. We're very lucky to have her here. <laughs> and hopefully this will be relatively painless for you. So, um, so you, you and I have talked, you know, a lot about this book, obviously, but I thought it might be useful to give a little bit of a of a summary for the people out there listening. Although this is a remarkably difficult book to summarize. Um, yes, you know, I would say. It, you know, obviously it's a book that encompasses the, many systems, the systems of the body. It also talks about, it brings in, you know, political systems, the state, uh, the solar system, computer systems. You know, it's a, it's a book that has many layers and, you know, and, and, and encompasses many things, but the story is told through um, our protagonist, Ella, who is studying to be an astrophysicist, um, but she's having trouble completing her dissertation. Um, and then we also uh, have dedicated chapters to her partner, Elle, her mother, stepmother, her father, and her older brother. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and we see each of these characters through a, a, a history of their bodies, illnesses, trauma, and, and, and their relationships to Ella are kind of looked at through those, the, that lens, the, uh, like a clinical almost lens. And, and we also kind of jump around in the, in these, uh, in, in the, in the chapters, we jump around in time and we jump around in geography. And um, each chapter has a, a subheading, you know, we, uh, 
we talk about the the um, the, the past imperfect. I think is is one of the restless present is is where Ella is, and she's in New York. So I just wanted to ask you about how how you went about organizing all these different layers, time, geography, and um, did I get confusing? <laughs> Well, yeah, it, it is a, a, perhaps the most complex novel that I've written. Um, it didn't, uh, I didn't mean it that way, uh, strange as it can, can sound. Um, I first had the story of Ella, and that was it, basically. But as I was writing, I realized that, uh, first of all, I realized that she was an astrophysicist, and she was interested in, in the cosmos. And as I continued to write, uh, other characters appeared, uh, namely the father and the mother, who is actually the stepmother. And so I thought, oh, maybe this is a novel about three characters. So I'm going to write, it's going to be a short 100 pages novel, a novella, and it's going to have three characters. But as the writing of each of those also grew, and it's really a novel that has five parts five sort of main characters and not necessarily much of their long history, although there's <clears throat> details here and there, but it, it was meant to be like a, a book that was composed of three characters who the three of them suffered from some sort of body ailment. But as I was saying, then uh, Elle appeared, her <clears throat> um, partner, and then the elder brother also developed as a character. And it was actually quite a lot of fun to bring them alive um, and think about what their ailment was and what was going on with them. And as I was writing, I was actually feeling that I was sort of holding all these characters in the air. And fortunately, I had the time for writing, so I was able to sort of follow them. But other characters sort of sipped in, friends from the past, other boyfriends, violent relationships from the past, uh, colleagues, um, <clears throat> aunts, and so on and so forth. So in a way, in a very strange way for me, this is a sort of 19th century novel, which has all these many characters, right? But at the same time, written in a very, I think, contemporary way, because it's a novel that is also fragmentary, that is a novel that is thinking about, because she is thinking about the space, right, the cosmos and the planets and black holes. It's also a novel that really thinks about time and geography, which are dimensions that time and space, of course, uh, dimensions that we as human beings living on the earth think of in a certain way, in a very sort of uh, rigid way, but in space is quite different. Right, and so I, I try to introduce these notions of time and space as how she would think of them. And this actually ended up structuring uh, the ways in which the novel plays with past and present and the country of the past and the country of the present and also notions of future, right? So <clears throat> I really can't tell you how I did it. I think if I tried to do it again, I wouldn't be able to, it just happens in the writing and that's also I think the magic of it that you kind of discover how a book is written by writing it and I think that has been my experience with every single book that I've written. Yeah absolutely <laughs> I think um you know you you've taught me so I mentioned many of the systems that that this book kind of encompasses but I, mm -hmm. I left out the most important ones which is the system of yes. language yes. Um, and, you know, Ella is a person who goes back and forth between languages and, and some of the, the funny parts of the, of the book. Um, and, and you've also said, so I referred to it also before as, as a book that's told kind of in a clinical way, but mm -hmm. it, it's also important for me to specify that the book is very poetic. And, and you've said before that you see Ella as, as a poet. Um, yes. And so I, th I thought I think that's interesting, and I think you know I've translated two 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 of your novels now, um, Seeing Red and and Nervous System, and both of them have protagonists that I kind of see a little bit 
not that they're autobiographical novels, but I see so, a lot of you in them. You know, they're Chileans and they live in New York. And But the protagonist of Seeing Red, obviously, was she was a writer. And this protagonist is an astrophysicist, which seems like a big difference. But maybe it's not really, you know? Why did you, why, why an astrophysicist? And why failing, or a failing, a failed astrophysicist? Yeah, I, as I was trying to think about Ella, as I created Ella, yes, taking some little elements of my own experience as sort of, as a base. But as I was thinking about her, I was thinking, what is really what she does? Where is her imagination? Um, what makes her think the way she thinks and relate to others the way she relates to others. And I actually had to decide this as I was writing. So I first had like maybe 20 or 30 pages of writing and already there was this very poetic language. And I thought she's like a poet, but she also isn't a poet. And I wasn't really struggling with this. And suddenly I remembered that as a young um, aspiring writer as a young journalist that I was back in the day, I had actually interviewed two very important poets in Chile who happened to be professionally one uh, sort of an abstract mathematician and the other one was actually an astrophysicist. Mm -hmm. And I thought I was in my 20s, my early 20s, and I was thinking this is so odd that these are like really scientific people. people do you hear me? Yeah, I stopped hearing you for a second. Okay. I don't know what happened. So okay. I think it's my Let me repeat, let me repeat. So I was thinking, how is it possible that these two very scientific minds are actually poets? And that I really never ended answering to myself. And I don't think I asked them this question. But as I was thinking, I thought, well, I, as I was actually starting to read about astrophysics, uh, I realized that many astrophysicists actually had to imagine space before they could prove um, by a mathematical equation that the existence, for example, of black holes or the existence of the orbits or the existence of the moving of the, of the movement of the planets and their velocity, etc. So there was something about sort of this conjectural thinking and being able to capture what is still not there that I thought suddenly was a very poetic procedure in the writing itself. And mm -hmm. that's when I really decided, yes, so she, she's actually an astrophysicist, um, but she's also a poet as these two other men that I had met in, in the past. But the difference was that Ella is a very contemporary astrophysicist. And as I was also reading about astrophysics, which I completely fell in love with this discipline, I realized that astrophysics is just not the way it used to be because now the technology has allowed uh, scientists to really actually see even before they imagine. And this is the great deception for Ella. She loves astrophysics, uh, astrophysics because it's the realm of dark imagination yeah. where she can sort of imagine, right? She's more interested in the conjectural, in the imaginative than the actual hard maths that of course astrophysics uh, also requires. So that's where I thought, yeah, she's a failed astrophysics because she's more of a poet. That makes a lot of sense. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so there's a line in, in, in the book that I think people quote, have quoted a lot, that, that the father says, pain is the awareness of being alive, which sounds like a, a, a pessimistic kind of observation, perhaps. Um, but I tend to think that, that the book in general, I tend to think that it has an optimistic ending dare I say, a happy ending. Maybe not happy, but at least optimistic. And it, and it makes me think, you know, there's like, there's something so tender and genuine about the relationship between Ella and her father. And, um, you know, I, I, I wonder if you thought consciously about that, because I tend to, I tend to have this idea in my head that, that happy endings are always false. Um, and that the hardest thing in the world to, to 
to do must be to write a genuine happy ending. Um, what do you think? Do you, do you see the ending as optimistic? Do you think, did, did you try to write an optimistic ending? <laughs> I love that question. I actually hadn't thought about that. Um, I actually think of myself as a unhappy ending uh, novelist, so, so to speak. Um, and in general terms, uh, a little bit obscure in my writing. Um, and I actually don't really think that this is a, well, neither a happy ending nor an optimistic ending. And I don't want to talk too much about the ending just in case yeah. I'm going to spoil it for somebody who is already half in the, halfway in the book and, yeah. and wants to know what happens. But I think in a way, this is a dystopian novel that finds a way to, to bring some hope maybe. Yeah, maybe more than optimistic, it's, there is a sort of an element of hope in the end. And yeah. I think it's given through the fact that all of the characters actually are suffering the novel from something, but they kind of learn how to relate to each other. And they find that the way to, to sort of deal with the pains of the past is sort of, sort of con connecting back, sort of taking a trip together, uh, yeah. to put it sort of very uh, ambiguously. Yeah. Um, I think this is what sort of there's all these sort of broken characters, I would say. And I think that the most um, obvious character, the most uh, evidently broken character is the elder brother who mm. suffers from osteoporosis, which is a strange uh, ailment for men, not, not very usual. But he is actually a, a broken soul, right? And his body is sort of always breaking. Um, it's sort of metaphorical, but also somehow literal. But there is something to mend in this book. The system, the family system, has a lot of breakings in the middle. And there is something about sort of this mending that I think that the daughter and the father kind of find in the end. Although I think there's also some a sort of open end too, because we don't know what's going to happen to yeah. the father. Right, so right. they sort of, Im they kind of imagine a future together uh, in yeah. a way. And this is not really a spoiler because it's just very general, but it has to do with that. And, and I think that maybe you're right. Maybe I really needed to write a book where there was some distance taken from Seeing Red, which is a more, uh, how to say, it's like a terror uh, novel mm -hmm. seeing red and, and the ending is sort of very a scary one so to speak so right. I think that I was also trying to write a different kind of book I always try to write a different kind of book kind of I always want to teach myself how to write this new book in structure and in theme even if I also come back to my to my obsessions which I honestly cannot avoid you can't avoid your obsessions that's why they're no. obsessions <laughs> they come back to me yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, I think that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I, you said something else that I thought was really interesting uh, before, which is that, um, there, that we as human beings have two ideal states, which is health and love. And these are, I guess the things we're all, the, 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 thing, the, the ideals that we're striving for, but they're also impossible because, um, yes, chaos reigns basically. And um, so, so I guess what I see in, in, in the book overall ultimately is, is maybe an acceptance of that state or an acceptance of that imperfection, an acceptance of the inability to ever really achieve those ideals. So I don't know if that's really, I guess it probably can't be called optimistic, but, um, but I think that there I is some, it, yeah, I think I, that's a very good point, Megan, because it's not really optimistic, but there is some sort of realism in that situation where you stop. I mean, I'm thinking more generally here in life, um, you know, sort of perfectionist is somebody who really suffers a lot mm -hmm. because it's a person who is always striving to arrive to a sort of state that doesn't really exist. So right. that's always going to fail while somebody who accepts that love is never going to be perfect, mm -hmm. that it's hard to achieve, that it can be temporary, 
um, or this, in the same way that health is just a sort of a, an impossible state, they were also always dealing with some sort of menace to our bodies or, or negotiating with viruses and bacteria. I think that that puts us in a level of sort of realism that is has less expectations and therefore allows us to be happier somehow. Yeah. I don't know. Or at least I'm speaking of something that I that I think about a lot, right? That uh, mm -hmm. we're not going to find perfection in the world. We're not going to find percep perfection in relationships, nor are we going to find perfection in our bodies. But the fact that we are able to accept that can give us a sort of a, a sort of a I don't know, a, a calmer life, sort of to accept that it's not going to be perfect, that we can try, but we're always going to fail. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I also wanted to talk a little about the politics in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that I don't think that we have talked about before. But there are a couple of scenes in the book. There's one where Ella goes to an anti-nuclear um, protest. And th there are a couple of protests in the book. And then, and then yes. there's this, this line, which I thought was really interesting. Um, I'm going to read it. These days, the students of her preterite country didn't play with marbles. They went out to protest in crowds, carrying posters, speakers on their shoulders, their little brothers and sisters in tow. Orphans of authority, dancing, denouncing, spitting, uncontrollable, breaking windows, breaking ranks, hit by nightsticks, ga gases, water cannons, sulfuric streams that threw them to the ground if they didn't manage to escape. They fell on their backs sometimes, broke their vertebrae or their heads, while the students of her present dozed in their chairs, far from it all. She wondered if they would ever wake up from that apathy. So. That's really interesting to read now in the context of what has happened in Chile yeah. since that writing and in the context of what has happened in the United States since that writing. You know, we've had the, mm -hmm. the Black Lives Matter movement. And so, you know, I, I guess I just want you to talk a little about that. I'm not sure what my question is, unless my question is, do you think they woke up? <laughs> do you think the students woke up? And, and, and I don't know. It, it, that part almost seems to prefigure what happened, you know, in Chile mm -hmm. in 2019. So, yeah. I don't know, do you think this will all? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because um, sometimes the sort of the, the news outlets make us feel that uh, the protests, the estallido social of October um, 2019 um, happened right there and then. But it was actually ongoing for 10 years, you know, feminists and students and other social organizations were on the streets more and more. So I think that more than prefiguring what happened, I was just very attentive to how things were unfolding, mm -hmm. how there is an increase in um, supremacist uh, groups right here and there and everywhere, unfortunately, how uh, women also have been activated even before uh, Me Too. There was, especially coming from Argentina and then sort of amplifying to the rest of Latin America, the New Namenos movement, which I think would be no one less, something like not, that. Not one less, not one, yeah, not one. Yeah, no woman less, something like that. So all of these, or, or the, the pro-abortion marches in Latin America. So sort of the, the sort of the fuel was adding and we were seeing this all the time. So I think I wanted to bring this as the background of a world that is also sort of failing, right? To, to, to sort of meet the, 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 the needs of the people in, sort of in many realms. So I wanted, I wanted to bring this in and I also wanted to sort of match violence because, you know, I teach Latin American cultures and I see that so much of, of the teaching of Latin America has to do with either revolution or violence, right? As if our continent was a place of violence, of violent people. But in fact, in the United States, and the United States has been very enmeshed in our violence and also creating right. and triggering 
a lot of that violence, but also there's a lot of violence in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. At the frontier, uh, children being separated, uh, mass graves being found here and there, uh, climate change, which is another form of maybe slow violence that suddenly is sort of kind of going into flames. But I, I want to sort of, sh sort of think about the fact that both in the country of the present, which is more or less the United States, and the country of the past, uh, which is more or less Chile, there were some echoes. And, and the echoing between the United States and Chile is something that I've worked on before, because as you know, Megan, seeing red sort of taps on the fact that there's two 9-11s for uh, Lucina, who is the protagonist of that novel, right? right. It's the 9-11 of the coup in Chile, which was uh, supported by the United States, the CIA, and also the 9-11 of when she arrives to New York. Right. So I kind of came back to this question of echoing, I think, in a less national way and more in a more sort of continental way, where all these forms of violence, which are also uh, triggered partly by capitalism and savage capitalism or neoliberalism, as we call it, uh, are happening everywhere now. It's not Latin America. It's not Chile. It's actually the world. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I can go on asking questions, but I also think that we were going to leave some time to take some questions from people in the audience. I'm not sure. Are there any questions? So it looks like there's one. Um, I just want to remind everyone in the audience that you can ask questions by clicking the ask a question button and just type it in there. And then I'll read it out loud to Megan and Lena. So um, let's start with one we have. Can you both talk about the relationship between writer and translator? Sure. Who starts? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who starts? Well, I mean, I can say that, it, that the relationship between writer and translator for me is very special in general because I, I, I tend to always work with living writers, which means that my writers are very involved in the process of translation, which which means that um, I ask a lot of them. I tend to ask a fair number of questions. And Lena's, in this book in particular, I had a lot of questions. I think I had a lot more in, in Nervous System than I did in Seeing Red. Um, partially because there's a lot, you know, there is a lot of, there are a lot of layers to the book and there's a lot, there are a lot of kind of plays with language and, um, you know, I just, I just had a lot of questions and Lena has always been very generous. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time talking over Zoom and sending messages, um, kind of going back and forth. And, you know, Lena is a writer that I have a lot of admiration for and every time I translate something by her I feel like I learn a little more about writing in general um, and I guess I don't know I guess I guess that's what I would say mm -hmm. yeah I would say let me see what I can say about this uh, I think it's been a very sort of lovely work relationship because in the process Megan and I have also become friends and Megan and I are almost neighbors in, in Santiago. We, we live very near and so we have sort of developed a relationship over the years uh, and that is actually very helpful. I know it seems that I'm talking about friendship but you know like trusting your translator is a very vital uh, thing. And I have always loved the fact that Megan asks very many questions. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to, to discuss language with her, which is something that I love. I've learned a lot of English in the process because although people tell me, oh, you should translate your own books, but I actually can't because the nuances are very difficult. And my characters are very literary, I think. The, the kind of writing I do is very literary. And there's a lot of wordplay, and sometimes those wordplay uh, games are very Chilean, right? They they actually are based on some uh, saying coming from Chile. So you have to know a lot of Chilean, but then you have to really know a lot of 
of course, literary English to be able to, to turn that phrasing in Spanish that is already also distorted to play with it, to actually replay it and come up with something ab absolutely new in English. So that has been sort of very fruitful, I think, in our conversation about language. And sometimes it's about, Megan, what do you think about this? Would this work? And she says like, hmm, but how about this? And always that moment is like this aha moment, which is absolutely wonderful. The other thing I don't do is I don't reread my novels in English, which is, I think, something that Megan would want me to do, but I've decided never to do. So if there's a question, I always go back a page or two, maybe, or just a paragraph, depending on the question. Uh, but I have decided to trust Megan because I feel that if I went into the, into the sort of into the writing of the entire novel, I would want to rewrite the novel again. Not, not because there was a problem with the translation, just because I always want to rewrite everything. So that would yeah. be a nightmare. And I decided absolutely not to do that. But I think that, again, trust it has been a very central thing. And also, it's been a lovely thing to see how Megan has to struggle, not I, but she, with actually not only two novels, which are quite different in their approach to language, but also some short stories of different periods. And each time, I think that we do something new together somehow in, in that sort of conversation. Yeah, I think I agree with all of that. I think it's really interesting how people, I mean, it makes sense, I guess, that people would tell you that you should translate your own books because your English is so good. But it's also like, mm -hmm. it's basically saying to you that you, like you have to go back to a book that's already finished and, and rewrite the whole thing. Like that just sounds, that sounds terrible. Whereas for me, it's really enjoyable, you know, because it's like, it's like <laughs> a very intense form of, of reading and and it's also creative because i also learn you know in in this book there there are a lot of we haven't talked about this but there are these you know sections of yeah. words three four words or phrases in italics that are kind of like po poetic uh little flashes little sparks in the book and i feel like those especially do they play with you know they play with words and, and a lot of them also play with uh phrases so you know, for me, a lot, sometimes I don't know the phrase that you're not only using, but you're kind of adulterating and adding another meaning mm -hmm. to. And so, so those things in particular take a, a lot of creativity, I think. And, and a lot of like, I feel like a lot of what I do is, is just um, thinking about kind of the rhythm or the sound of the mm -hmm. Well, um, that's not something that I, I should have said too, that it has to do with like, I remember our first conversation about seeing red and I remember saying, listen, Megan, you don't need to be so literal. I, I would love you to actually produce the rhythm that this book has in Spanish into English and it won't be the same rhythm because just Spanish and English don't have that. That, that, that sort of rhythm, rhythm doesn't translate. But I'd rather you also play with the language as much as I've done. And I know that you tend to always sort of stick to the novel. It's not that you wrote it, you translated a version that is unrecognizable or, or anything like that. But sort of the playfulness there is just very, very central. And I think that, that that's why I, I like you to be my translator because you're, you let yourself go into that too. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, I think you're right that, that, that the relationship makes that possible. Like if I, if if we didn't if we didn't talk about the language and if we didn't if there wasn't trust i don't think i would feel as free to do that mm -hmm. that was such a great answer <laughs> wow <laughs> um okay so we have another question and this one's for lena how has your relationship with <laughs> illness evolved after writing your two books how is my relationship with illness after writing my two books? I think I would change the question. I would say, how, how is my relationship to illness before writing my books? Because mm. <laughs> I think my relationship to illness has actually inspired uh, so much of my writing. Not, not only illness, but just sort of being so aware that we all have a body and that our body is so fragile. And I think that's something that really uh, marked me uh, while growing up for several reasons that I've 
discussed elsewhere, but sort of basically it's that I grew up with a condition that was uh, very difficult to handle when I was a child. And my parents are both doctors. So it's both that I had to be very aware of my own body so I would not be in trouble. But then at the same time, my parents talked uh, nonstop about medicine and bodies and kept diagnosing people. And I was really caught in that language. Uh, and I was caught in the, in the imagination of the body. Because I sometimes, I, I, I have said before that I think that sort of medicine, the sort of um, casos clinicos, clinical cases, are like detective stories. You need to find who the assassin is and your body is giving you all these clues, right? And so I think that really captured my uh, imagination as a young girl. But I also think that the experience of growing up with a condition um, made me also very aware of the politics of the body. So I think that because I bring both the language and the experience and because I was very aware of sort of the, the immense amount of disciplining that medicine brought and also not only disciplining, but sometimes moralizing, um, that has somehow been translated into many of the reflections that are included in these books. And to be actually more specific about nervous system, it is that my two previous novels about disease, one is Fruta Podrida or uh, Rotten Fruit, which has now been translated into English, and Sangre en el Ojo or Seeing Red, still sort of frame the story where there was the diseased woman and the healthy others. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in uh, Nervous System, I just felt that that had to change. I had to complicate that question and maybe stop thinking in sort of these uh, sort of black and white ways and actually go further into the idea that nobody is really healthy ever or not completely or not all the time or that eventually you will face uh, some bodily ailment and how that is also connected to the ways in which our social relationships work, our work uh, is developed uh, our, you know, uh, climate conditions, etc., and so and so that's why nervous system became such a complex novel because I decided very sort of um, decidedly, so to speak, to to make everybody sick, so there would not be like black and white. Everybody was sort of inhabiting that gray zone, mm -hmm. and my question was, and what happens when everybody is in that place? sort of in a different ailment, but fragile. Mm -hmm. And that's what sort of what really drove um, the novel and what I discovered. And I discovered sort of things that were happy and things that were also sometimes a little tragic or, you know, worrisome or, or depressive and then maybe optimistic, as you were saying, Megan. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how, how, I mean, I think it also prepared me for this pandemic. Uh, the entire reflection that I've done on medicine. Uh, how much do I take care of myself? How much do I take care of others? And how much do I try not to panic and be paranoid and try to not medicine completely take over my my existence? And so that has been a sort of a difficult, I think, balance for, for everybody, and including me. But I think that my own novels and my own thinking train me to to, to sort of face this moment in a, in a better way than it wouldn't have if I hadn't done all this thinking. Right. So what are you writing next? Oh, <laughs> sorry, there's my phone ringing for some reason. Uh, what, am I, what am I writing next? I actually was just in Mexico uh, in the, what is called the, uh, 100 Years of Solitude Home, mm -hmm. which is where Garcia Marquez, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, the great Colombian author, uh, wrote his 
most his best known novel and the home it's a long story but to make it short uh, the owner of the home, uh, to honor Garcia Marquez, left it for a, sort of a literary residency. So I was invited there. Uh, I couldn't uh, spend much time there, so I decided to write a play. So I've written a play, and that's my, my oops, sorry. So that's my latest. Sorry about that. That's my latest uh, work. And right now, I'm not working on anything. Actually, I'm just resting, taking a break. Lovely. That's exciting. Yeah. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> um, unless we have more questions, I think we might be out of time. Yeah, I think so. Maybe. Is it? She said 7.40. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Is Caroline there? We've been abandoned. <laughs> so Megan, well, what are you right? What are you working on, Megan? Just to finish with you. What am I working on? I'm finishing up um, Alejandro Sambra's Puente Chileno. We're doing the oh. the copy edits right now, and that will be out in early next year. So I think in February next year. So that's what I'm doing right now, and then I'm preparing to go to the United States on Friday on Friday the 13th, oh. and I'm going to take a whole week of vacation. Good for you. Excellent. Very long time. <laughs> and then after that, who knows? Yeah, well, we don't know what's coming, right? Yeah. Yeah. We don't know. Um, I feel we've been a little abandoned here. <laughs> yeah, I think something happened to our uh, main moderator. So but, maybe um, we assume that there are still people out there listening and that we should just thank them for listening. And um, Lena, it's been really great to see you. And I really appreciate you staying up until one in the morning. Yeah, actually almost two, but uh, let me also say that I am very thankful, uh, Megan, for this translation. I am actually very excited and, and also thankful to uh, my editors at uh, Grey Wolf for publishing this book in what feels to me like a very timely moment when we are all so, um, when I think everybody is just really thinking about their bodies, their health, uh, what is going to happen and really having to struggle and, and be very patient, right? Because it's just been a really difficult time. So I want to just thank you for that. So anyway, and thank you very, very much for, for being with us tonight. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. And I agree. I hope that everyone who's listening buys the book and reads it because it is very timely and, and also, and also timeless. <laughs> okay, so goodbye now. Bye-bye. Good night. Sleep well.